And our second speaker today on the panel is my Heartland colleague, Linnea Lucan. And Linnea is a research fellow with the Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy at the Heartland Institute. Uh, while she was an intern, uh, excuse me, intern with the Heartland Institute in 2018, she co-authored a policy brief debunking four persistent myths about hydraulic fracturing. Do you remember who you did that with? I don't know. Somebody. Somebody she co-authored that with. Anyway, uh, Linnea is a, gra a graduate of the University of Wyoming in 2018 with a BS in petroleum engineering and a minor in geology. And before coming to Heartland, or in between, in between her Heartland stints, uh, she worked in the Gulf of Mexico on deep water drill ships as a logging geologist. So she's going to give you a presentation right now on why big oil pushes green energy. So give it up for Linnea Lucan. So there's a little bit of a miscommunication with the title of <laughs> the presentation, but uh, that's okay. So <laughs> that's all right. Today, what I am going to talk about is a handful of misconceptions that exist and are perpetuated in the media about the oil industry. And I'm going to try my best to explain what they are, why they exist the way they do, and what's wrong with them. I have my remote. Okay, so what we're going to cover is one, recent industry news especially that pertains to the claim from the Biden administration that oil companies are greedily hoarding land and drilling permits in order to, I don't know, increase prices unfairly or manipulate the markets. Um, is Biden correct in this, even in part? Many people also have a knee-jerk negative reaction to pipelines. So I'm going to talk about how pipelines are actually just about the best way that we have to transport petroleum products. And finally, is the oil industry just running around, you know, ripping up the environment and treating it poorly? What do they do to protect the environment and how effective is it? All right, so in the news lately, especially at the beginning of last year, there was a lot of talk, especially from the president and his administration, about how the US oil industry is supposedly not drilling and not producing enough to keep prices down. They also complained about profits in the last couple of months, but the drilling issue and the permitting issue is really pretty interesting, actually. Um, so on March 3rd in 2022, Jen Psaki told reporters that the administration's moratoriums and the slow walking of new leases and lease auctions could not be to blame for rising prices because they were, quote, had, having 9,000 approved oil leases that oil companies are not tapping into currently. Later, she did adjust this to say that she meant 9,000 unused drilling permits, not leases, but the media ran with this anyway. And they said that companies were, and the word they use is stockpiling, um, greed, as if they're greedily hoarding the leases and the land and the drilling permits, probably both. Uh, is this an accurate picture? No. <laughs> what I, I can forgive the activist journalists for not understanding the ins and outs of the industry I can't help but wonder if the administration is aware that their perspective on this issue is misleading at best and something akin to victim blaming at worst. So here are the facts on the leasing and permitting information. Um, the Bureau of Land Management is a little bit slow in updating their data. The latest we have is from September of 2022. But as it is, we can see that there were 9,000 drilling permits approved and available to drill and 4,579 awaiting approval. I pulled up published data from the BLM, not that BLM, um, and found that a very low number of leases have been offered since Biden took office, 407 which is half as many as last year and the lowest since the 1940s. Of all the available leases, 66% of them are currently producing, which is actually quite high when you go back and look at the data about the percentage producing on leases in previous years. And I have some of that data, it's a little bit small on that screen though. <laughs> Um, so there's no stockpiling of leases when 66% of them are producing. 
But 2021 did see quite a few approved drilling permits, many of which have not been used yet. All right, let's see. Oh, and this is a picture of all of the wells in the United States, oil and gas. This is just to give you perspective on what we're talking about when we say that there are you know, 9,000 permits to drill out there. You can't even see the individual points of all the wells here. Um, and this is just the contiguous United States. This isn't even Alaska. <laughs> So why would a lease not be producing? Um, not every lease is going to be a winner, unfortunately. Sometimes you might investigate the property and find out that it is either uneconomic or there are not enough reserves to make it worthwhile. Some wells even come up dry and you still need to get your drilling permits anyway. And there are other permits that you need to get besides just drilling permits. Um, for example, you might have to have a right of way to build roads and related infrastructure that would make the site safe and legal to access. Um, because a lot of these places are very remote. As you can see it, from that previous slide, it's pretty much all in some of the least populated parts of the country. Regulatory uncertainty is the big one on this. A drilling company or an oil company is not going to want to produce and throw a ton of money into a lease when the federal government has threatened over and over to end drilling, especially on federal land. When that rug can pull out, be pulled out from underneath you at any point in time, you don't exactly have the incentive to pour a bunch of money into it. And additionally, you have the ESG movement which is making it harder to get financing for a lot of these projects. So what about the permits to drill? There are a lot of permits to drill that have been approved, but the wells are not necessarily being drilled. Well, same with the lease issue. There are a lot of reasons why a well might not be being drilled at the time. One of them is an oil company doesn't necessarily just get a permit to drill and then drill and then move on, get another permit to drill and drill. You stack them up ahead of time, sometimes years ahead of time. It's again, with that regulatory uncertainty, sometimes very far in advance. <laughs> so one lease also will often have multiple drilling prospects. You will get dozens of permits in advance so that you can investigate or even just begin drilling spuds, which is the start of a well, multiple locations on one lease and across multiple leases. Um, some other issues, so let's take offshore, for example. Um, a drill ship and its crew are contracted, right, by let's say BP. A lot of people don't know that a oil company is not necessarily the same thing as a drilling company. So you will contract out and then you want to prove that you have jobs coming up, so you'll get all these permits to drill ahead of time. And then things start to happen, because as we know, weather exists. <laughs> and as the picture I have here is of a big water spout that I took a picture of, it's basically just like a water tornado. And if one of these comes along and hits your drill ship, that can put you out of service for a little bit. And it has happened in the past. Additionally, Hurricanes are a major and constant threat, especially in the Gulf of Mexico. It can make you have to move your entire drilling operation out of the way for a pretty good amount of time. Also, um, as we saw with the COVID-19 issue, staffing, crew can be an issue. Crew can be a reason why a drill ship is not drilling as much or as quickly or as many wells as they could. I'm sorry, my mouth is getting a little dry. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the time you would be sitting there ready to go back home and get relieved, and then all of a sudden you get a fun phone call saying, actually, you're not going home today uh, because your relief just pinged positive for COVID. So you get to stay out for at least a couple more days until we can find a replacement for you. So that can delay your drilling as well. There are countless things that can throw you off track, and all of these things happen all the time. <laughs> no plan survives first contact. 
And that is true for military stuff as well as the oil industry. The next issue is lawfare. And a lot of us are very well aware that this goes on constantly. Um, they will use, or the green side will use lawsuits in order to put a stop to different projects, especially pipeline infrastructure in recent years. While these don't always end up settling in the activists' favor, they are a huge time and money sink. And a lot of times companies will go ahead and just cancel a product or a project so that they don't have to deal with it or they'll settle out of court so that they don't have to deal with the years of delays and costs piling up. Because as I said, contracting out a drilling rig is expensive. Every single day can be millions of dollars. So you don't want to just sit there <laughs> having fun getting sued until you can finally get back to work. As I said, pipelines are always under attack by lawfare. Um, but does the specific targeting of pipeline infrastructure really make sense if you're an environmentalist? I would argue no. Um, so this myth, the first myth that I'm going to cover here is that banning pipelines like the Keystone XL will actually stop us from using the oil that was supposed to be transported through it. And this is obviously false. Banning pipelines will only limit where, how, and how efficiently and cost-effectively the oil can be transported. Oil by gas and by rail has become increasingly popular over the last couple of years as pipeline infrastructure is increasingly under attack by lawfare and government blockades. In the case of Keystone XL, we're still shipping the oil from Alberta to refineries on the Gulf Coast but now it's coming by train and by truck. And if you ask me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're concerned about emissions. <coughs> I am so sorry. I'm struggling with my voice here today. Um, so the next claim that they have are that pipelines are more dangerous than other means. And this is outright false. They're, is a truth in that if a pipeline were to break and have a severe catastrophic break, that it could, in theory, release more oil into the environment than what a single truck accident or a single train accident could hold. But the truth is, modern pipelines have sensors at regular intervals along the entirety of the pipeline that immediately detect a change in pressure that will tell you if there is some kind of a leak happening somewhere along the pipeline. And once that leak is detected, it can be shut in so that only a certain segment of the pipeline is at risk of losing fluid. Um, the study, this study that I have uh, cited here on the graph is from the Manhattan Institute. They actually found that oil pipelines are the least accident prone of all other methods, and that's by quite a large margin. Trucks are absolutely the worst. And there was another study that found that oil by rail is four and a half times more likely to have an accident than a pipeline. This is a nice little web that I'm going to let you sit on for a second, <laughs> showing pipeline infrastructure across the United States. They were so up in arms about Keystone XL and about certain pipelines on the East Coast. Um, I'm not sure that a lot of environmental activists are quite aware of how much is going on in their neighborhoods and in their, uh, underneath their feet in some cases, but this is all the oil and gas pipelines in the United States and also crossing into Canada. What a lot of people also don't realize about Keystone XL is that it already exists, but what this segment was going to do was increase the volume. In fact, that volume, like I said, is still coming, only now it's by train, which is a lot more dangerous. Do pipelines increase emissions? A study by the US EPA found that if the Keystone XL were allowed to go through, it would increase emissions by 18.7 million tons of CO2. But when you look at the emissions of the entire world, that's basically a rounding error. And that's assuming that the oil isn't going to come anyway. 
Several studies have actually shown that air pollution and possibly even total greenhouse gas emissions are worse with rail than with pipelines. So if emissions and accidents are your concern, pipelines are actually one of the better options out there. Finally, the final myth, and one that I am quite passionate about, is that oil companies are just going around killing the earth, spilling oil everywhere, trying to destroy the planet. You know, the Gulf of Mexico is dead because the oil industry has killed it. Um, so this is just not an accurate picture of reality. There are, in reality, a ton of programs that target reclamation, groundwater conservation, wetland conservation, active greenhouse gas reduction technology, if that's something that you're worried about, and just day-to-day -day procedures that make sure that every single day the industry and its representatives are maintaining the healthiest environment possible. So I'm going to go over a couple of my favorite projects, a little bit of everything as examples of this, as well as some of my own experience working offshore on deep water drill ships. So first, if you don't think that oil companies should be left to their own devices anyway when it comes to the environment, worry not. There are federal agencies of plenty that specifically target the oil industry. The Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BESI, was formed alongside several other regulatory bodies after the Deepwater Horizon tragedy. BESI gives hefty fines to any offshore rig that fails to maintain federal environmental safety standards. And in my experience, oil industry personnel actually hold themselves to a much higher standard than the federal standards. The extreme environments that they are working in are hindering to being able to be as alert and active as you would think that you could be on a in a more, I don't know, stable environment. Um, but they still maintain a super high level of environmental awareness out there. Trust me, like if you, you know, drop a straw wrapper over the side, someone's going to come get you. Um, a few project categories that I want to highlight in specific are the reclamation of abandoned drill sites, um, artificial reef support in the Gulf of Mexico and oceans everywhere, Offshore operations that continue actively to protect wetlands and restore them if they had any kind of uh, drilling activity on them. There's also the fact that a lot of companies are all in on climate-related goals. And this is something that is not talked about very often at all, but many renewables companies are actually subsidiaries of the largest oil companies. Many companies are also walk, working on things like carbon capture and storage and other carbon dioxide limiting programs. So the first project I am going to highlight is a um, award that was given to an oil company by the Bureau of Land Management called Restore New Mexico, which gave them this award over the reclamation efforts and restoration of abandoned well sites, and also that company's efforts to make well pads less intrusive on the environment and um, smaller in general, which can pretty much only be achieved with directional drilling. Um, you can drill m many more formations from a single well pad rather than spots all over the place. And if you've ever seen photographs of the Permian Basin, you'll know what I'm talking about. Looks like a nice big checkerboard out there. <laughs> um, the Pecos Watershed Conservation Initiative also has several oil company partners. They seek to preserve and protect the Pecos River and its tributaries, um, and they also run through the very active Permian Basin. And this is a picture of the Pecos River. And in the background, you can see a little well pad and a little horse head pump working away. This is my favorite project of all time. <laughs> um, one of the first things that surprised me when I was working offshore was that there was a huge amount of biodiversity all around us. I thought for sure that because it's a great big lit up floating industrial site in the middle of the ocean, that it would be like a graveyard out there. But that is not the case. Fish very much love oil rigs. <laughs> they are all over it. You're basically creating artificial structure out there. 
Um, the Gulf of Mexico is pretty much a flat sand bottom muddy plain, and there isn't a lot of places for something like a rare cold water coral to latch onto, but they have started discovering them on some of the abandoned platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. So because of that, conservationists became very alarmed when the federal government said that they want to get rid of many of these rigs offshore because they are attracting fish and rare invertebrates. These are pictures that I took. It's really hard to see. They're, I was way up on the rig, but um, barracuda and mahi-mahi swimming out near the rig. Anyway, so I hurried it up there towards the end, but there are a lot of programs that are really cool. I recommend anyone look into Rigs to Reefs because it is um, a neat program that if you love scuba diving, um, you can do some pretty cool exploration around old abandoned offshore drill sites. Thank <laughs> you.